Hi everyone! In today's video, we're going to be covering Tommy Lynn cells, otherwise known as the Coast to Coast Killer. But before we get into this video, I'd like to give a disclaimer that if you are uncomfortable or do not want to hear any of the topics we are about to cover in this video, I totally understand. There's no hard feelings, but please, for your own health and well being, click out of it. Check out any of the other videos I have on my channel or find something that has a bit more of a lighthearted feel to it if that's what you need to keep yourself feeling okay and feeling safe. In this video today, we will be covering topics that include child abuse, murder, drug use, sexual assault on adults and minors for multiple cases. So, a brief description of what Tommy Lynn Sells did Tommy was an American serial killer. He claimed to have killed over 70 people and is believed by the police to at least have murdered 22 people. He was eventually apprehended after the murder of a 13-year-old Katie Harris or Kayleen Harris and the attempted murder of a 10-year-old Christelle Surles. For the crime, he was eventually awarded the death penalty in 2000 and was executed in April of 2014. He was also convicted of the murder of Stephanie Mahoney in 1997, which had received a life sentence for in 2003. He had previously served some years in jail after sexually assaulting and stabbing a 19-year-old woman in 1992. Despite his claims, the state attorney in Jefferson County, Illinois, did eventually end up not charging him with the Dardines family homicide in 1987. There were just inconsistencies to what happened and on his account, it just didn't line up with what the police had on record for their forensics. Now before we get too in depth on those cases, I'd like to go over his early childhood. I believe especially in Tommy Sell's case, if his childhood had gone better, like if he was allowed to stay with his aunt, which he claimed that were the best years of his life and he actually felt taken care of and nurtured, maybe he wouldn't have turned out the way he did. So Tommy Lynn Sells had a twin sister named Tammy Jean. They were both born June 28, 1964 in Oakland, California, United States, to a single mother named Nina Sells. Apart from having a twin, he also had three other siblings. The family moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and shortly after, the 18-month-old twins, Tommy and Tammy, both contracted meningitis. Sadly, his sister Tammy did end up succumbing to the disease and passing away. Tommy was then sent to live with his aunt Bonnie, Bonnie Walpole, in Holcomb, Missouri. He was eventually returned to his mother at the age of five because he found out that Bonnie, his aunt, wanted to adopt him. Again, I feel like if that had happened, it would have been amazing for his life and his turnout. Instead, he went back to his mother, and by the age of seven, he began drinking. At the age of eight, a man named Willis Clark began spending time with him and molesting him. Tommy's mother, Nina, knew about this and basically gave her consent, which, he, which Tommy had stated really affected him badly, not only mentally, but physically. And I can imagine. I honestly couldn't picture being a parent and ever letting this kind of thing happen to my child, let alone just being okay with it. Like, the, you know it's happening and you're not going to do anything about it. Tommy began drinking more heavily, and by the time that he was 10 years old, he had dropped out of school completely and decided that drinking and smoking pot would be what he wanted to do instead. Eventually, at 13 years old, he climbed into his grandmother's bed naked, and after that incident, his mother took his siblings and moved without him. He came home one day, and they were just completely gone. This made Tommy become homeless. So as a teenager, homeless in the United States, he traveled across the country from 1978 to 1999, during which time he had drank really heavily, started abusing more drugs and substances, and even though he occasionally took short-term jobs and usually involving manual labor or at barbershop jobs, he was never really one to know and be with a career or a job for long term. He was in jail several times for committing various crimes over this couple of years. So his previous crimes and mental disorders that were easier to find research on to tell you about include these. 
In 1990, Sell stole a truck in Wyoming and was sentenced to 16 months of imprisonment. He was diagnosed with personality disorder there, consisting of antisocial, borderline, and schizoid features, substance use disorder, which honestly isn't shocking considering he started at the age of seven, severe opioid, amphetamine, and alcohol dependency, bipolar disorder, although it's unclear if it was one or two, and major depressive disorder, along with psychosis. On May 13, 1992, Fabian Witherspoon, a 19-year-old woman in Charleston, West Virginia, was driving when she saw Sells panhandling under an overpass with a sign that said, I will work for food. She felt sorry for him and took him to her home, asking him to wait outside. She went into the home and got some food for him, and by the time she got back to her front door, he had been inside the house. She walked away to get something else for him, and he got... He got he got a knife from her kitchen, trapped her in the bathroom, and attempted to sexually assault her. The woman fought back, however, and hit him in the head repeatedly with a ceramic duck. Then she managed to get control of the knife and stabbed him multiple times, nicking his kidney and liver in addition to his testicles and I believe his arm. In retaliation, Sells beat her over the head with a piano stool. Sells tried to get away, but his injuries landed him in the ICU and inevitably into police custody. Witherspoon sustained significant injuries herself, including a gaping hole in her head and a cut to her hand that required surgery. After this attack, Sells took a plea deal on malicious wounding and served five years in prison. While serving this sentence, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder again and married Nora Price. He was released in 1997 and moved to Tennessee with his wife, Nora. He then left her that same year and resumed his cross-country traveling. So some of the in-depth information known on his crimes include the fact that Tommy Lynn Sells committed his first murder at the age of 16. He broke into a house and found a man performing fellatio on a boy and killed that man in a fit of age. I can only assume that's because he felt enraged due to how he was mistreated as a child. He must have kind of had like flashbacks or a moment of understanding that that was wrong and he just couldn't control himself. He had to kill this guy. He claimed that he had shot and killed John Cade Sr. in July of 1979 after Cade caught him burglarizing his home. In May 1981, he briefly reunited with his family in Little Rock, Arkansas, but he was told to leave after he attempted to have sex with his own mother. I think that's a horrible circumstance, but I also think that is a really good look into how his mind was definitely not average anymore. It had been far gone. He took a job at a carnival roustabout and headed to St. Louis in 1983. But before he went to St. Louis, he confessed to killing two people, including Hall Atkins. All of that was before leaving Arkansas. On July 27, 1985, while working at a force in Missouri in a carnival, he met 28-year-old Anna Corded and her 4-year-old son, Rory. He was invited to spend the evening at their house. According to his account, he had found her stealing from his backpack following a consensual sexual encounter they had and beat her to death with her son's baseball bat before turning and killing the child to eliminate any potential witnesses at the time. On May 13, 1992, he had sexually assaulted, beat, and stabbed a 19-year-old woman in Charleston, West Virginia, who had offered him food after seeing a placard reading, I will work for food. He was indicted on five counts of rape and felony assault in September of 1992, but following a plea deal, he was imprisoned for malicious wounding until 1997, as mentioned previously. On December 31st, 1999, Tommy Lynn Sells entered a Del Rio, Texas residence and sexually assaulted and stabbed and then slit the throat of a 13-year-old Kayleen Harris. He also slit the throat of 10-year-old Cristal Surles. Cristal Surles managed to survive, however, with the help of her neighbors. She managed to travel a quarter mile with a severed trachea in order to receive help from her neighbors, too. I think that's outstanding. I think that she must have been absolutely terrified, but that terror helped her have the sheer power to live through that circumstance and get help. We'll come back to that case because it plays a key role in his eventual conviction. 
So, the known victims of Tommy, because he did claim 70, there are 22 known victims in total that the police could correlate to him. I'll go over some of them now. July 5th, 1979, Port Gibson, Mississippi. John Cade, 39, shot with a 32 caliber revolver. An unspecified date in 1982, Little Rock, Arkansas, Hall Atkins, was shot but survived. July 31st, 1983, St. Louis, Missouri, Colleen and Tiffany Gill, both were bludgeoned. Colleen's 34, Tiffany is 4. July 26, 1985, Springfield, Missouri, Enna and Rory Corded. He slashed their throats and bludgeoned them with a baseball bat. Enna Corded was 28, Rory Corded was 4. 1987, May 1st, Lockport, New York. Suzanne Korzik was 27. Her body was found September 5th of 1995. October 5th, Lovelock, Nevada. Stephanie Stroff was 20. He strangled her and her body was never recovered. November 17th through the 18th, Ina Illinois, the Dardine family. This is the one that he wasn't officially indicted for. Keith Dardine is 29 years old. He is the father of the family and shot three times in the head before his penis was mutilated off of his body. Peter Dardine was the son. He was three years old and bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat. Casey Dardine was their daughter and bludgeoned with a baseball bat. Aline Dardine was mother. She was 30 years old. She was sexually assaulted, mutilated, and then fatally bludgeoned with a baseball bat. After she had died, she was violated with that same baseball bat. In 1988, September 11th in Salem, New Hampshire, a Melissa Tremblay, 11 years old, was sexually assaulted and then stabbed. She was then left on a train track to be ran over after her death. Her body was found the next day. December 18th, Tucson, Arizona, Kent Loughton, 51 years old. She was stabbed. Her body was found two days after the event. December 9, 1991, Marina, Florida, Teresa and Tiffany Hall, both were bludgeoned with a wooden table leg. Teresa was 25 and Tiffany was 5. May 13, 1992, Charleston, West Virginia, Fabian Witherspoon was 20 years old. She was sexually assaulted, stabbed 18 times, and then bludgeoned with a piano stool, but she managed to survive. In 1997, October 13, Lawrenceville, Illinois, Joel Kirkpatrick and Julia Ray Harper. Joel Kirkpatrick was 10 years old and was stabbed. He passed away. Julia Ray Harper was assaulted and managed to survive the encounter. On October 15th, Springfield, Missouri, Stephanie Mahoney was 13 years old, abducted, drugged, sexually assaulted, strangled. Her body was found November 18th. In 1999, Gibbonson, Tennessee, Deborah Harris and Ambria Halburn, Deborah Harris is 31 years old, sexually assaulted, stabbed, and then left with a knife out of her chest, like sticking out of her chest. Ambria Halberton was eight, and it says incidental stabbed, I think that he was just in a fit at the moment. That was like almost a crime of passion for him. He had no control over it. April 18th, San Antonio, Texas. Mary Perez, nine, she was abducted, sexually assaulted, and then strangled with her t-shirt. Her body was found 10 days later. May 13th in Lexington, Kentucky, Haley McCone, she was 13, abducted, sexually assaulted, strangled with her t-shirt as well. They recovered her body after it had been covered in debris post-mortem. That was 10 days after. An unspecified day in May, Madison, Wisconsin, an unnamed inmate claimed to be assaulted by him. July 5th, Kingfisher, Oklahoma, Bobby Lynn Wolford, 14, was forced to perform oral sex on Tommy and then was then sodomized and shot in the head. He took her earrings and her remains were found November 4th. December 31st, Del Rio, Texas, Kayleen Harris and Crystal Serles. Kayleen Harris was only 13 years old. She was sexually assaulted and stabbed 16 times before he slashed her throat. Christelle Serles was 10 years old. He slashed her throat and she managed to survive by escaping to her neighbors. Here are some of the possible but not confirmed victims of Tommy Lynn. 
an unspecified date and unspecified location, an unnamed man was shot when cells caught him assaulting and abusing a young boy. In 1980, Los Angeles, California, an unnamed man was stabbed with an ice pick. In Oakland, California, an unnamed man was assaulted and cells was unsure if the man had lived or died. In 1982, Little Rock, Arkansas, April 27th, Joanne Tate and her daughters. Joanne Tate was 35, sexually assaulted with a broomstick and then stabbed with a knife. Melissa Davis was seven years old, stabbed and survived, and Renee Tate was four, stabbed but also survived. An unspecified date, an unnamed woman was abducted, sexually assaulted, tortured, and then killed, but her body was never recovered. So they couldn't completely correlate to if it was Tommy or not. February 28, 1983, in St. Louis, Missouri, an unidentified girl between the ages of 8 and 10 was sexually assaulted and then killed. Her body was found, but her head was never found. An unspecified date in the year of 1988, in Redding County, Idaho, an unnamed woman and her son. In 1989, January 27, Truckee, California, there was an unidentified woman. January 30th, San Francisco, California, Aline Mischoff, who was 13. In May, Roseburg, Oregon, an unnamed woman was sexually assaulted and killed. May 9th, Roseburg, Oregon, an unnamed woman again. An unspecified date in 1997, Dwin Falls, Idaho, an unnamed woman was sexually assaulted and then killed. She was cut up with an axe and buried post-mortem. April 15, 1998, San Antonio, Texas, Thomas Bros was 40 years old and shot. It's good to note that Sells again claimed to have murdered numerous other people and that his victims are claimed to exceed over 70. It's unknown if he was trying to work the system and get more publicity from that, if he was trying to be known as one of the most evil men in the world, or if that was true and he just couldn't fully recount all of these cases to the cops in specific details because of his drug use and mental decline by this point. This leads us to the arrest and confessions that he made on December 31st in 1999 in Gulia Bay subdivision west of Del Rio in Texas. Cells had sexually assaulted and stabbed, inevitably killing 13-year-old Kayleen Katie Harris before slitting the throat of the 10-year-old Crystal Surles. Now, again, Crystal got to survive that account, thankfully, with the help of her neighbors after traveling a quarter mile with a severed trachea. Sells was apprehended after being identified from a sketch that was made from the victim's description. Police over time came to suspect him of working the system by confessing to murders he had not committed. I'm unsure if he wanted the publicity from that, if it was true, or if in general he thought he would stay alive longer by telling them more and more info. There's multiple different reasons that people can claim that they killed more people than they actually did, but there's also a lot of evidence showing that he might have had a very high murder rate and that there was no way for him to be able to cognitively recall all of the events that had happened due to his mental instability and drug use. The state attorney in Jefferson County, Illinois, did decline to charge Cell with the Darlene family homicide in 1987, because his confession to the quadruple killings, even though genuinely consisted with the facts of the case that were reported, there were also facts that were reported in the media. There was a few inaccuracies with the concern of some of the details that had not been made public, however, and he had changed his account three times regarding how he had met the family and what had happened before the murders. Investigators wanted to bring cells to Southern Illinois to resolve their doubts on that case, but Texas refused. It has a law forbidding death row prisoners from leaving the state, especially so they can't get charged and given life sentences in other states beforehand. Cell was housed on death row in the Allen B. Polinski unit near Livingston, Texas. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice received him on November 8, 2000. In 2004, Sells finally confessed that on October 13, in 1997, he had broken into a home, took a knife from a butcher block in the kitchen, and stabbed a little boy to death. He then had scuffled with the woman living in the house. These details corroborated the account of a Julia Ray Harper, who was initially convicted for the murder of her son, but then acquitted in 2006. This all leads up to his execution. And inevitably, I felt like that was going to happen because he is in the state of Texas. 
On January 3, 2014, a Del Rio judge finally set his execution date for April 3, 2014. Sell's death sentence was carried out at the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville. When asked if he would like to make any final statements, Sells just solemnly replied, no. As a lethal dose was given to him, he took a few deep breaths and closed his eyes and began to snore as if he was sleeping. Less than a minute later, he had stopped moving, and 13 minutes later, at 6.27 p.m. Central Time, the United States, he was finally pronounced dead. Crystal Surlis, the girl who survived, and members of both the Harris and Perez family had attended the execution. Now, Tommy is a case that was able to be well covered by the media, and they have tons of interviews from him and the people working on the case. Here's a couple of examples of how the media used this and how he kind of got into the media. So eight, year, eight years before his actual execution, Sells was featured in an interviewee episode of Cold-Blooded Killers on season one of Investigations Discovery series, The Most Evil. The interview was conducted by a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Michael Stone. In the interview, Sells claimed that he had killed more than 70 people. ABC's News created a 10-minute mini-documentary, Tommy Lynn Sells, The Mind of a Psychopath. And in 2001, A&E Network's original show, I Survived a Serial Killer, made an episode featuring Fabian Witherspoon's story. Now, before we wrap this case up, I'd like to say again, this is a situation where you can compare nurture versus nature, and you can kind of see he had a lot of things in his background that could potentially lead to all of this happening. And I'm not excusing his behavior at all. What he did was absolutely horrific and none of the families deserve to have to go through those traumas. However, I think if he was allowed to live with his aunt and not go back to his mother and be abused and start his drug use, he would have had a better opportunity to live a normal and maybe less violent lifestyle. I wish that we were able to ask him those kind of questions, but he has been executed, obviously. That being said, he and many of his actual interviews did state that living with his aunt was the best time of his life. He also made statements claiming that he lived to provide hate to the world. He was hate embodied. He didn't believe in the word love or forgiveness and that his life's goal and what made him happiest is when he could see the life drain from people's eyes. He ended up saying and relating it to being better than any drug fix he had ever gotten and I think that speaks volume on where his mental state really was by the time that he was apprehended. Other than that, that is the end of this episode on Tommy Lynn Sells, otherwise known as the Coast to Coast Killer. If you enjoyed this episode or you have other cases and or unsolved mysteries or mysteries in general that you would like to hear about, drop them in the comments so I can start researching them for you. If I do make a video on the case you'd like to hear about, I will give you a name shout out. Don't forget to subscribe so you can have all of the episodes that I make as a notification. You'll never miss another one. And I hope that you get up. I hope you stretch. Have a good day and hydrate, please. Take care of yourself.